So we're there good. you are. Yep. Now we can <laughs> hear you and see you. <laughs> Many different video systems. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, we're going to get started now. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us with uh, this evening session of Lens with Advanced Design. Um, I want to introduce our guest today, Nicole Ruliak. Um, a little bit about Nicole is she's creative director and founder of Level in San Francisco. She has deep experience taking complex new technologies and shaping them into forms that foster emotional connections between consumer and brands. Her work has helped uh, to create new industry categories and propelled products into the spotlight, garnering industry awards and recognition. Before founding Level, Nicole was an associate creative, direct, uh, associate creative director at HTC. She is currently the chair of IDSA Women in Design and has a mission to bring balance to the industrial design field at large. Thank you so much, Nicole, for being a part of Lens as today our topic is the gap between design education and industry, which is a very juicy topic. Um, and I'm very, um, we're very honored to have you here. So I'm gonna turn things over to you and then again, I encourage our guests to please ask any questions through the Q&A, um, and then I will do my best to um, integrate them into our conversation after, after Nicole's presentation. So take it away, Nicole. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Hector, Lenz, and for the audience today. I'm really excited um, to get to talk about this topic, something that I'm also very passionate about. Uh, uh, been formerly a teacher and mentor, I'm always looking to help bring up the future generations in the industry and do what I can to today to share my story of how I got to where I am and tell you a little bit about the studio and kind of um, how I pursue passion through design. And then we'll provide insights on um, kind of the journey along that process. So with that in mind, I'm going to start to share my screen. Can everyone see? Yep. Good. All right. So as Hector mentioned, I am the founder of a design studio in San Francisco called Level. And I also chair women in design for IDSA. Uh, here's a quick little picture of my studio, a place that brings me a ton of joy and happiness after you know 15 plus years working in the industry I now have found a place that I go every day where I can be creative and be around people that I love uh, to, to, to work with and you know put our minds together to create amazing products um, so this I'm just going to share kind of um, our studio philosophies and how and that sort of will lead into like where where I came from um, so we call ourselves an industrial design shop um, that envisions uh, and realizes inspired products of timeless integrity. Everyone has a different approach to, to design. Our lens is to try to create products that people love as much today as they will 15 years from now. Um, so products that stand the test of time and people will uh, want to keep for generations. I don't like things that are just super trendy and kind of will disappear tomorrow or be uncool. Um, that this is kind of level through the numbers of uh, after being in the industry for 15 years, uh, including school, doing this for 20, 20 years. Um, I have uh, brought a lot of uh, groundbreaking products to the market, uh, very recognized, uh, kind of at the forefront of many sectors uh, of technology, um, but also through that, I've also have spent a lot of time working with engineers, um, bringing products all the way from not just the vision, but also into reality and thinking about design through that lens. This is kind of a very uh, sl small selection of the clients that we work with, but I'm really proud to say that after you know three and a half years of having the studio, we have some really, really um, big companies that I prize that I have developed great relationships with, with and 
super excited as um, I've worked <laughs> my ass off through my career to be able to get to this point where I, I can call some of these great companies my clients. And also um, beyond just the clients, also highly involved in the IDSA community uh, and um, the design community as a whole. Uh, so I do a ton of talks working with women in design. I do a lot of mentorship programs. I participate in a lot of panels and also design awards and competitions, all with a passion for design and just wanting to kind of uplift the community and do what I can uh, to bring my experience to others and to, to share uh, what I've gone through. So here's a bit on the approach at the um, so we we look at products with vision like uh, whenever we're approaching uh, design we're really trying to kind of recreate a category or create something from scratch so we say our ambitions are lofty but we're really just uh, always trying to like kind of shoot for the moon and push clients to do kind of not the low-hanging fruit but like really really make a bold product that stands out and is also going to last, things that people are going to love. Um, I'll talk about balance in design, but also in life. I think balance is one of those words that comes up a ton and something that's really like true to my heart. It's like finding balance, uh, whether you're talking about proportions of design, balancing trade-offs of engineering versus design vision, uh, also balancing life like making sure that you can have a personal life while being able to pursue your passions. Um, but I also, because I am a big um, supporter of women in design, I'm also looking to find balance and having a diverse set uh, of people um, and people's minds in, a, in my studio and in the industry at large. And most of the products that we look for work on we look to push innovation whether it's through materials or technologies i think this example is one where uh, we're really changing the way that people um, can get treatment from doctors and i think in this current um, crisis with covid uh, this this device here was groundbreaking and being able to um, to show EKG remotely. So doctors can kind of get a, a multi-level view into a patient's heart from anywhere in the world that they're connected to Wi-Fi um, and something that was completely never done before. And kind of with all of our clients and projects, we're looking through the lens of how we do something and really help humanity by bringing new technology to the world and create iconic products that are really human and understandable. And one of my biggest passions and one of the strengths of our studios is we look a lot at design through the lens of materials. Uh, so I believe inherently that materials are the things that make products human, that makes people attracted to, to products, that makes it so that you see a product from across the room and you can really, uh, you really gravitate towards it. You want to touch something, you want to hold it in your hand. So from the very, very first brainstorms that we have in with my team, we are constantly thinking about uh, not just materials, but the way things are manufactured and how we can be really smart with the materials to make something that's stunning and going to make people want to use it, under, understand how to use it, and love to use the products that we create. <laughs> And we also work in a process that's called inside it out. And um, this is something uh, that I learned from the seven and a half years that I spent at HTC as how to work really closely with engineers. Is, um, you can't just design something in a vacuum um, without understanding how it's all going to come together. And I really feel like the best products that come out of this world are the ones where engineers are, and designers are working really closely together. So um, not just looking at how to make this, um, this pretty thing that's inconceivable, but working closely to understand the complexities of what goes on on the inside and collaborating super closely with engineers to make sure that those 
dreams and visions can become a reality. And I love the process of collaboration. In fact, we're learning great tools to use while we are all working remotely. But I will still say that this is the thing I miss the most at this moment in time as uh, being in the studio around my team, sketching a table, the table together. Um, I'm a very hands-on <laughs> founder. Um, I don't just sit in a glass office by myself. I interact and sit around with my team and sketch and ideate and I'm highly involved in all parts of the creative process. And I love and miss so much to be around <laughs> these people. Although we're on video calls <laughs> all day long together, it's still literally really miss being in the same room. So I'm going to show you just a few of the recent projects. I'll probably go through these pretty pretty fast, but um, Tempo is one of our clients. The project just launched in February. Perfect timing uh, for an in-home fitness system. I will say I am so happy. I brought the one from the studio to my house um, as we've been sheltering in place. And it is great to be able to have a fitness option since the gym is no longer a possibility at this moment. Um, but what we were doing was designing a smart in-home training system that's using computer vision. So with the sensors inside of the system, uh, you're able to count reps. They can um, they use 3D, uh, 3D sensors to be able to detect when your body is in the wrong position. So um, they have live classes and trainers that are behind the scenes and you get notifications on the screen when your position is off, which helps um, kind of people that typically used to be afraid of these type of workouts and weight training um, to know that they can do it in, in their home uh, where they're comfortable and do it and still knowing that they're getting uh, feedback from trainers. What was a real challenge about the designing the system was um, as you can see it's pretty small and we've designed it to be as elegant as, um, and furniture like uh, as, po as we possibly could. But when a client first came to our office they literally just dropped off all this stuff along with the computers and sensors and TV screen and they're like, you need to make this into something that people are going to want to put in their living room. And it was an unbelievable amount of equipment that actually comes and it all fits compactly into this nice, uh, like beautiful piece of furniture-esque technology equipment. Um, so our, our job was not only how do we store all of these uh, weights and dumbbells and barbells, um, yoga mat, etc., but how we do that into in the product that feels right to fit not only into your home, but also feel like a gym and and still kind of have that edge of feeling feeling modern enough, feeling like futuristic technology, um, but yet not making it too out of place and foreign uh, in in your living room. Um, so I think we had created some really um, uh, elegant solutions to storage and how all the equipment can can rack and sit in, in your home. Um, here's an example of it being used in, in someone's bedroom. Uh, with uh, I will tell you, I've been using it a ton <laughs> since we've been sheltering in, in place. And it is a, a great workout and the trainers and the, just the immersion of the experience is incredible. Uh, here you can see a, a little bit of the back view where we have a smart racking system uh, that fits the, the dumbbells and barbells. So you literally can fit all of that equipment into a, a footprint that's just one foot by two feet. Um, and the other great thing about the system compared to some of the other options available is that there's no wall mounting required. So you can move this around your house and put it wherever. It's totally flexible. Uh, and um, I think you saw throughout the art direction that came from the, the, the brand studio that worked on this, but um, we were really influential, uh, not only the product through the CMF, but also uh, the palette that we created for the weight, super fresh and fun, and ended up uh, influencing a lot of the, the marketing and uh, content, the digital content that came out when Tempo launched. So um, it's great to see, um, to be a part of a project like this. It's also super cool. What I love about this product in particular is that we started working with a startup of just two founders who had 
very little money to work off of. We were really smart in the way that we approached the design to make sure that they could get to market. And we helped them um, to raise, uh, with the design to raise funding and get to launch and grow the team to, I think they have 20 or 30 people now. It's hard to keep track of. Um, but when we can help our clients to uh, not just create a beautiful product, but to help them really grow and succeed, it's amazing. And the next product I'm going to show you is, um, this is the EKG device that I was talking about earlier. And what it is, is giving the most detailed view into a person's heart that's ever been available on a mobile device. So oftentimes in the past, you've probably seen pictures or been familiar with like the heart, heart detection devices that ha require you to put like 12 different stickers of electrodes attached to a machine um, that you have to wear for long periods of time. Um, with this device, what's great is it's super compact, like hardly bigger than a stick of a uh, pack of gum. Um, and you can carry it around in your pocket. You can use it anywhere um, that you can use your phone uh, to send data directly to your doctor. And it runs through AI algorithms um, that are able to automatically detect and see uh, details of that heart reading um, that are uh, sometimes invisible to even doctors. So the algorithms themselves are actually more accurate, proven to be more accurate and better than, than what doctors can, or what doctors can see. Uh, so these are just some examples. I will say what I really loved about this project is that there's not usually a lot of time and thought that goes into medical equipment. Anybody who's used an EKG device or just been in hospitals and clinics in general, you'll see that um, it's kind of a space that, place that's been completely untouched. Um, so when we had a client that was kind of very modern in, in their thinking, and they had a lot of developers um, and VPs that came from Apple and Google who really wanted to do um, thoughtful, approachable, like modern design in the medical space. I mean, this is technology that's saving people's lives, that's uh, helping them become aware of heart conditions um, so that they can get treatment or, or deal with, the, with those conditions. Um, and, you know, to, to uh, prevent them from having heart attacks and strokes. So this is really, really important technology. There's no reason that it should look cheap or like a device that's un unconsidered. We wanted to elevate the medical space and make the technology feel like as premium, as great as the kind of devices that you're used to carrying around your smartphones and your laptops. They're all like carved out of beautiful metal, very like solid uh, unibody plastic parts. So we kind of br brought that thinking from our work in technology uh, into the medical space and created a really groundbreaking product because of that. But also it's captured in a, has a nice leather carrying case with a no, little magnetic closure. So thinking beyond the device and really treating it kind of like a consumer technology product that we're used to. And quickly, I'll sh just show you Murmur briefly, uh, just to show you the kind of breath we work on, although we are you know, pretty close to Silicon Valley, so we do do a lot of the work that's at the forefront of technology, but um, there, we still get to dabble in uh, furniture and textiles. And this one is an interesting kind of look in the cannabis space and something that was completely uh, like not tech driven at all. This is a little bit just showing you kind of the process and our collaborative culture behind the design. Here's some of the inspiration, but we were looking at the cannabis space and how um, to make cannabis not look like just the kind of um, accessories that you go to hate street in like kind of a old school hippie style, but like how do we bring a fresh modern edge to the world of cannabis? Because there's a lot of that that's going on in, um, in vapes and um, kind of in the dispensary space, but not a lot around um, other products. So we're bringing uh, we call the kind of design vision, the icebreaker. And we wanted to, um, kind of reduce the stigma that is has been in years past and um, kind of associated with cannabis um, by making it the making um, 
your storage accessories, your consumption accessories, and of devices that are so desirable that when people see them sitting on your counter, um, that you create this or yeah, like um, you create this vision of like a modern bar cart um, where it makes people curious and stimulate kind of positive conversations around uh, cannabis, cannabis consumption from the modern era. And so here's um, you know, the design pillars of the language using these beautiful carved surfaces, shifting blocks, that, like an icebreaker looks like an ice block that shifted inside of the glass container and prismatic crystal forms and created a whole language of cannabis products and accessories from a carved marble tray, a stainless steel um, smoking vessel. Here is a storage device. So one of the reasons this client was super excited to work with my team is because we actually have quite a few women and some moms on my team. Um, and big push in the in this project was to create lockable storage devices so that children um, and people that shouldn't be getting access to these are not able to to get into gummies and other things that they should not be consuming um, while still keeping this modern fresh thing that you can you can feel comfortable keeping out on the counter or, or in your house where your friends are able to see it. So here's, again, uh, some examples of the language that we developed and uh, the glass jars. This was uh, the leather case here you see is for on the go, um, you know, in your car to um, also deal with the, um, the, the laws about open carry uh, also require locking devices in your car. So this is a really smart and elegant solution to going out for a night on the town. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit uh, examples of um, my studio's philosophies and just a little um, little overview of a few of our projects. And now I'm going to jump into how I got here, <laughs> where my where my history is from. Uh, so I have been in San Francisco for 20 years uh, this August, uh, but I originally grew up in Chicago, or at least I tell people I grew up in Chicago because <laughs> the icon of Chicago is kind of um, kind of much more something that I aspire to than the actual cornfields where I grew up. But uh, I do at least appreciate having grown up and going downtown to the city and seeing the beautiful like architectures. And I think what um, Chicago did to the architecture scene many, many decades ago, as far as innovation, I think it's that same kind of thinking and, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries that drew me to eventually make my way to San Francisco. And um, in my childhood, I wanted to sort of reflect on like why I became an industrial designer. It was just, for me, it seemed like the only thing that I knew how to do, like the only thing that I would, that I would find myself doing for hours and hours of the day is just like all I ever wanted to do in, was build um, as all of my early memories. It's just um, like, you know, some kids, some girls play with Barbies and I was the one that would just like nail together wood in the garage and be building houses for them instead and building like bike ramps with <laughs> and things like that with my friends. So I just, um, from the <laughs> earliest time I can possibly remember, it's like all I did was want to make things and that's never really stopped in me um, except that I grew up in a very very conservative family that unfortunately was not in downtown Chicago but uh, way way on the outskirts um, very close towards the edge of the cornfields um, where there weren't a lot of people that knew about industrial design and design was never actually a part of my life at all growing up and, and in fact, to the point where I told my parents that I wanted to go to school and study design and they were adamantly opposed to it. They told me that art was a hobby and uh, not a career. And, well, they didn't really understand that there was a difference between art and design, but regardless, <laughs> that, that was um, sort of my upbringing being told that I couldn't, but I uh, like to live 
in life with no regrets. So I decided to pursue my passions anyways, and I moved to San Francisco uh, to pursue uh, my design education. So I was looking for a place that I felt that I fit in. San Francisco, was in, um, at that time, 20 years ago especially, had a huge creative community and just a place where there were people with kind of like myself, very rebellious spirits, um, people that were experimental and, you know, wanting to push, push the boundaries. And I felt like I really fit in here and uh, loved being a part of that culture, especially when I spent my years here going to college at the Academy of Art um, and then graduated 2005 and worked my way through the industry, uh, landing some of my first jobs at kind of the well-known and recognized industrial design studios of their time. Uh, New Deal Design was definitely one where I um, got a lot of training and upbringing there, and I met a, a ton of friends, so a lot of people that you see in the picture here are still close friends of mine today who I love and cherish, including my husband, who I met while working at New Deal Design. Uh, we worked really hard, um, but we also played really hard and had a ton of fun creating, you know, incredibly iconic products that also really put New Deal on the, on the roadmap in those days. Um, so after working at New Deal, I also landed a job at a studio called One & Co, which was also an amazing place to learn, had incredibly great design culture. And uh, we went through an acquisition with HTC after seven and a half years of doing that, kind of a total about close, about 12 years of working in the industry. I was looking around at kind of feeling antsy about doing something and moving on and decided to take a bet on myself and start my own studio. Um, I will say, interestingly enough, um, as I was kind of getting that feeling that like I, I just kept crossing through my mind. I kept constantly thinking about it. Like I want to go out on my own. I want to start a studio. Um, it's, it was really hard to find the courage. Uh, I had, you know, over a decade of experience. I had won tons of awards for the great products. I had a great um, support from my community. Um, but there's just something that felt a little scary. And I would say, it's just it, part of the thing was when I looked across the landscape of industrial design studios um, at that time, there were almost none that I knew of that had female founders. And not that I thought that that should be a problem, but it's just something that you question when you look, look around, uh, um, you know, what's possible when you don't see a ton of role models kind of do, doing this, um, you just wonder if it's not possible or what's keeping so many women out. And I'm just gonna say, uh, you know, when you search on Google for uh, famous industrial designers, this is kind of a picture of what you see. Uh, so I think you can easily understand uh, how it might be daunting. It might not feel like you fit in or that there is a place for you uh, or that, you know, that this is a world that you belong in, uh, especially at, the, at a high enough level as, as a founder. You know, I, I would, I'm so glad that I took the chance and did it today. I would say it was scary wondering if clients were going to trust me, if it, clients were going to want to pay me equally, if I was going to be able to garner the you know the trust and the recognition from from the industry from clients from my team um but i also like i said like to live with no my life with no regrets so i, I did it i took the chance and i uh started my studio level um as i mentioned earlier i happy walking into the office every day normal life <laughs> I'm so happy with the, the team, the type of clients, the type of work that we're doing and what I've been able to build and couldn't be more proud of what the team has achieved here in like less than four years. Um, what I also really appreciate is because I'm the boss, I get to make decisions on what I do. So um, 
balancing motherhood and uh, having a career uh, can be challenging in in the industry, but especially in the design industry where people tend to work super hard and you have to be incredibly passionate and dedicated. Uh, So I often wondered if I was going to be able to continue that path um, as I became a mother, would I be able to be as good of a designer, uh, you know, having to balance my time. But I will say having the family and having my own studio really allows me uh, to find that balance. And my family is definitely highly involved in, in the studio, especially these days. My daughter's popping up in meetings all the time. <laughs> and um, my my team all loves her. So it's, uh, it's great. Uh, I can kind of make both of those worlds work together nicely. And I'm going to talk about the work I do with women in design, uh, my vision to build a better future. Um, so I've, I've been chairing women in design for a couple of years now, um, since the early days of starting the studio. I went to an IDSA Women in Design Summit and just had a great connection with all these women and decided to come back to San Francisco and kind of rejuvenate the audience and uh, like reconnect with people on a more regular basis. So we were, uh, my goal was to start Um, with doing events and happy hours and connecting more women. But through that, I realized that the real ticket to helping get more women in the field and kind of, and um, getting them uh, on the right path to success was to create a mentorship program. So it's the part of women in design that I'm most passionate about and most proud of is the work that we've been doing to connect women and, um, help them with all help help them to have a space that they can have an open dialogue and ask questions and get advice um, and just um, build their confidence and comfort um, and help them find their way through their career so i'll end on a note and say uh one of my favorite people on earth is ruth bader ginsburg And I love her quote, we should not be held back from pursuing our talents, from contributing what we could contribute to the society because we fit into a certain mold. And so I know this topic is on education, but I'm bringing this women in design aspect um, in here because I do often see um, that there's an even bigger gap for women getting into the field. So I want to highlight that I'm here to help everyone and to have, to to um, be an influence and you know word of advice for all people. But I'm also uh, especially want everybody to do what they can to bring greater diversity to to our field um, and to help make sure this these graduating classes um, land jobs. <laughs> so that's all. Okay. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for uh, putting that presentation together. Um, and I hope that uh, one day, um, you know, our attendees who are tuning in get to experience your studio. Your studio is wonderful. I had an opportunity to visit and uh, it's breathtaking and it's in a beautiful neighborhood. So um, yeah, thank you for showing us uh, your amazing work. And um You know, I am going to start taking these questions into consideration. And as we continue to have this this talk about design education, I'll kind of integrate them in our conversation. But um, we can start off with a really big kind of question as far as design education goes. Um, You know, since you're based in the Bay Area and design education, I feel, is different geographically. you know, I want to know what I would love to know your opinion on the state of design education from your perspective as a, mm-hmm. as someone who leads your, their own studio and then someone who is also located in, in the Bay Area that's surrounded by design culture and all these amazing schools. And then obviously someone who hires designers because, you know, um, a couple of days ago we had uh, here on Lens, we had Ellen Posh, who also is transitioning from school and working now at level so i would love to know your perspective on the state of education yeah sure so i'm super happy that we hired ellen and i will highlight that 
Ellen is one of four DAP graduates that we have on our team now. So <laughs> almost half of our team comes from, from that program in, in Cincinnati. And I, I mean, I can start there just saying um, that we've had absolutely nothing but success from, from that school. And I would say, I, would, I find that the big difference, and I think the students will say the same, is the co-op program, program that the students go through. We see far and above better uh, thinkers and better talent coming out of that school. And I don't necessarily think it's the teachers and what they're learning in the classroom, but I think it's the requirement to have so much on the job experience before they graduate um, that they just have the ability to jump into their career much easier. I think they understand the, how studio, how design works from corporate world to ID studios um, and they really gear their thinking and their portfolios and their skill sets to understanding the work world. And so that's the big difference. And it's funny because um, you mentioned being in the Bay Area and uh, you, one would think that the schools in the Bay Area being so close to Silicon Valley and kind of, you know, really well known and uh, highly regarded um, design teams here, um, that we'd be seeing better talent coming from the schools here. Um, but I will say I, I am a product of a Bay Area school, um, but I have been pretty disappointed with what we've been seeing. I think a lot of the work is too conceptual or um, kind of not geared, not geared close enough to um, reality in terms of like what skills students need. And yeah, I just, um, I don't think they're teaching the right things. I don't think the schools that I've seen here have the right approach. And it, it's like I talked about balance, balance is important. I want a slight amount of, con of conceptual thinking. I want enough to think that I understand somebody can think outside of the box and they're they're not so grounded in reality that they're that they're not willing to push the boundaries but i also sometimes the products projects can be so conceptual or just weird and just like not something that i could see translating into the work world at all <laughs> and um yeah also the the skill sets uh i would say generally the sketching and uh, rendering skills just aren't at the level that we need. I'm, I run a fairly small studio, you know, I was, we're 10 people now. Um, and so I need anybody that's on my team to be able to conquer <laughs> anything, whatever comes their way, whether it's like rendering CAD, sketching, but um, ideation, just coming up with ideas uh, is also really important. So. I, uh, I need to see your thinking and know that like if I give you an assigned project that you're going to come back to me with like a bunch of great ideas. So um, that's a that's a really important skill and I see a lot of the Cincinnati students being like incredibly good at it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks for answering that. Um, well, um, I would love to hear because um, I I um, didn't go to DAP, I, you know, and and there's other students in this uh, tuning in tonight that maybe have you know um, have gone to other schools, um, and of course I'm sure they would love to work at level. Um, and uh, yes, you're absolutely right. DAP does have this huge advantage of having this co-op program. Um, what is one advice you would give a student um, if they feel that they don't have the right resources or support from the faculty? to really uh, focus and to, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, self-educate. I think in the, in this state of, uh, in the state that we're in right now with everyone working from home and the resources that we have from, let's say, you know, YouTube University and, um, you know, other resources, what is something that you would advise a student to do if they feel like they're stuck? Um, I would say first find a mentor even if that means like hunting people down on LinkedIn, somehow like going through your, your teachers or like former students and tapping into their network, uh, finding a really good mentor, I think will help a ton. I think you need to get outside of the school <laughs> because yeah, I'm, 
I mean, my school was not bad, but I don't think I got to where I was because of school. It was because I was a pretty outgoing person and asked a lot for help and connected really well with a few good teachers, a few former classmates of mine who had already gotten into the industry. Just like make those connections and make them strong and get advice from those people and have them connect you with other people and use that to get portfolio advice, to get advice on what you need to get hired and also to help you find uh, connections for internships because there is no nothing better that you can do for yourself than to get internships <laughs> even if, even remotely i've still hired uh quite a number of people including interns at this time so i don't think companies are entirely holding back from that but like getting that real world experience is crucial so whatever you can do and just like be razor focused on getting an internship and talk to and like seek out whoever can help you open that door to get that internship sure absolutely um this is a very good question here and it's kind of a kind of two-part question um with the state of education right now during this pandemic where a lot of students are taking classes through zoom um mm -hmm. and maybe a lot of them don't feel that paying thousands of dollars like it's not justified to go back to school um one of the questions that was um, asked was do studios look into what university a student comes from um, and do you think that school is even required if a student secures enough real world experience? Can they just continue working in the real world and continue kind of um, getting promoted? Do you think that school's even a requirement to go back and get your degree? And this is a question asked by Chris and by David. Yeah, I mean, Times are changing, so I can't predict the future, but I can tell you that nobody that I know that's succeeded in this industry has gotten there without an education. So I, I know that's also harder these days, but um, there are still core skills that you learn in school, and it, it took me it took, takes everyone years to get there. Um, so I don't know how you can bypass that and get to the skill level that you need for landing a job. I mean, just to even get an internship, you need a certain skill level, you know, you need a port some form of portfolio. I need to be, I don't hire interns without have, being able to see um, a, how they, think, to be able to see how, how they sketch, to be able to see that they can contribute to the work. Um, so without being trained to sketch, to use the Adobe Suite, uh, to use CAD software, to render, to think about design, to think about how people interact with products and kind of create a storyboard and a vision around that, uh, I don't know how you can, I don't see how you can do that without an education. <laughs> Sure. Um, and I'm going to add a little bit to that question. What if you are, have already taken three or so years of school and have a couple of internships under your belt? Um, same question. Do you feel like it's okay for the student to just maybe not come back to school? If, if, I, I, I would still go back to school. Okay. First, <laughs> first, I think you should have enjoyed being in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think you should actually be in such a hurry to get into the real world. Uh, I mean, uh, you should enjoy the point in your life where you're there. Like, I love being in school and ha just having a, a little bit less responsibility. Um, and also, like, especially your, your senior year, I think is really crucial because it's the time where your skills have gotten to the level where you can actually s execute pretty good design um like skill wise and um thought process wise and it's the time you can actually like put that 
into who you are. <laughs> you know, like if school is a time where you're not just doing an um, assignment uh, from a client of, of the product, but you actually get to like really express who you are and what your passions are. And like, I would never want to take that. Uh, away from anyone that, that opportunity to do your like senior capstone project <laughs> and to really like put yourself into something um, and that also being said I just um, like it may work out for a little while like maybe me as a small studio may not care if you've graduated but I don't know if every company is the same I think they some be some some people might frown on that or some companies and businesses might frown on the fact that you didn't complete your degree. And it's not, especially if you're that close, it's not that far away. I would, I would just finish it. Yeah, and then nobody can take it away. Yeah. And also I think your, your last year is kind of your way to show um, the faculty and your way to show designers that come to the year end show to show them that you're leaving on top and for you to show off kind of your skills and you know the amazing ideas that you're coming up with um that you were able to do in the last four years mm -hmm. um stopping a movie like 10 minutes before the end <laughs> and never finishing <laughs> it's a very that's a good answer um i have a question here uh, regarding uh you know the lack of representation of women in design in your opinion what is the root cause of the lack of representation of women in design and what do you see as potential solutions? It's a really big issue with no easy solution, but you have worked hard to defy that reality. And this is a question coming from Dominic. I mean, I think it starts from the fact that you just don't see a lot of women in the field. So I think it can be really daunting for women going in to be able to see that they can make it. I also, um, I think it depends on where you are, but uh, sort of one of the reasons I, I brush on this that started my studio because I've been in a variety of work environments um, throughout my career, some that are very welcoming and some that um, are, they really em embraced me and um, had amazing culture but I've been in some places that were incredibly toxic and brutal <laughs> um, and there are just different philosophies and styles to the way that people run their show um, and I started my studio because I'd been and seen and known enough women that dropped out because they tired of these toxic and terrible places like People were just like mean and nasty and they run like dictatorships and, you know, the management star style was like to kind of pick on or like, I don't know, be kind of cruel to designers to get them to work harder. <laughs> uh, and that's, and I, but on the opposite end, I saw great places where uh, the, it was, you know, like a family and everybody took care of each other and we, you know, good design happened because you felt like people cared and then people cared for the company and wanted to see it succeed. And that's kind of the approach that I take at level. <laughs> um, but unfortunately that is, um, it's not everywhere. Uh, I think it's changing. I think um, some companies are having to learn their lessons the hard way. Um, and I think the more that we can, uh, people like myself, I'm not the only one, um, but I think the more women that I'm, there are other companies now that are setting great examples. I think Google is a great example. Um, there's some awesome women I work with on the team at, at Microsoft. Um, there are more and more women getting into leadership roles and you're seeing great design coming out of those companies. And so it is something that's like incredibly desirable these days and sought after. There's like a much more human approach to design that's happening uh, because women are getting into these leadership roles. So it's helping to change kind of the, the, the style of leadership, um, which is resulting in great products. And then it's also giving women examples of great role models who are, who are doing an amazing job. Um, and so I, I feel like that um, is slowly starting to change and that's happening um, 
at the, the right time for our studio because I will say I have clients that I think are <laughs> excited for the, the freshness that we, we bring to the industry <laughs> and sometimes hiring us just because of that. Yeah, and I think you're also setting up kind of the foundation for the next generation of women designers. Um, last year, we interviewed you on our podcast and you talked about how for a really long time, uh, as a woman industrial designer, you kind of, you know, moved up this hierarchy within a company. And then and at some point you kind of just stopped because there was no, there was no women designer, you know, before you that really broke that barrier. Um, mm -hmm. So that's very exciting. I'm, I'm really excited that you're disrupting this space mm -hmm. and really changing design history as we know it. Yeah, and I think it's a whole new wave and I'm hoping that we can influence the future because I think the attitude is different where it used to be like you have to just like try to be like a, a man and like develop your skills just to be like, um, you know, what has existed in the past. And I think um, everyone's kind of just thrown that out the door and I'm super happy that I get to like be myself, 100% myself and just lead and design as I am. And I try to teach both the men and women on my team to also like understand their strengths and just like celebrate the strengths <clears throat> and that the combination of those makes really great design. Um, and that understanding that the things that when you interview you sort of get trained to look for certain things and I don't know I don't want to fall into the like cliches and stereotypes but there are some things that maybe a woman is good at that maybe um, men don't always kind of understand because they're looking for like the typical skill sets but I think I'm able to with my team have honest conversations about that and just be just um pure you know, just pure and natural in ourselves and I think that is allowing us to like change our mindset about like what we're looking for in skills and how how we look at candidates differently and kind of like just know that like it's the combination that this person may be good at, really good at like rendering and this person may be really good at like thinking about the user experience and the kind of the more empathy um, and like, that's okay that everybody isn't good at the same things. <laughs> and like, that's what makes our, what makes the studio great is the combination of different approaches. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we have a question here by Sarah and her question is, what are some skills that you've had to learn in the industry that was not taught in your design education? Mm, I would say the the big thing and why I kind of led you through the studio philosophy, um, like one of the biggest things is about manufacturing. Um, and I think it's what, um, kind of the differentiator of our studio and also what I feel is really important for designers. Because I know, I've known throughout my career, a lot of talented designers that can make a beautiful, a beautiful rendering and a, a vision of something, but they don't know how to make that real. And so when I talk about how, um, how much time I've spent in Asia and working with engineers, I think it's that dose of reality of like looking at what it takes to do something innovative, what it takes to make a product, looking at products through the lens of materials, like cool ways you can injection mold things, cool ways you can stamp metals, like really innovative processes and 3D knitting, like all of these things uh, are ways that we look at how to make a product. So we're not just uh, making some dream of some pretty thing that we render that's totally not real. Like we really think a lot about what it takes to get to that end result. <laughs> Um, and especially like we geek out about manufacturing processes and like um, when we can go into factories, like watching how stuff is made. So I really think it's that thinking of like not just making this like pretty shiny like mock up, not just making this beautiful rendering, but like how do we actually like make the product and what are the technical challenges and really like think through a lot of that. Um, I think it's hard to get in school, but it was like I spent so many trips to China and and uh, also local manufacturers, just like that process of problem solving manufacturing. I really enjoy it and I think it's fun. And I think that's what I don't see a lot of students thinking about. 
uh, like we'll often in portfolios when we're interviewing ask students like like point to certain parts of a product and be like oh what is this material how is it made and um like that can be like <laughs> total like make it or break it uh part of the interview is just like i can see the depth in their thinking about if they're if that student thinks enough about how a product is made <laughs> yeah or else it's just a conceptual product right then you're just an artist <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um, here is, I'm going to merge these two questions. Um, it's, it's, at, it's asked by Adam and Rohith. Uh, getting your first internship can be pretty difficult. What is your advice for fresh graduates with no experience in the industry? Or, um, you know, what do you suggest for recently graduates uh, to have in their portfolio if they don't have much industry experience yet? Hmm. Uh. That's a tough. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with a step backwards and say, for those of you who have not graduated yet, please try to get internships before you graduate. Graduate. Um, I know that can be tricky. I will say, uh, I didn't sleep enough probably in my later years of school because I was often juggling internships and uh, school at the same time. It's hard, but really need to try to do that. Um, then if you have graduated and haven't, um, I say apply to everywhere you possibly can and network as much as you can through, your, I know it's hard because there's not events these days, but um, really tap into LinkedIn or anybody that you know that's graduated that's gotten a job. Um, I would say most of my work as a studio, most of my jobs throughout my career came from people I knew not from just like blindly applying. So I really, really recommend that you use your, your network. Um, and then um, as far as planning the job, the type of work that we see, I mean, I'll be honest, like a lot of interns, we are, they're, not, uh, they're not always gonna be the ones designing, but they often get put on good deal of execution work. So making sure that your rendering skills are really strong, that you know that you can get put on like tasks. Um, so like the core skills, like rendering, sketching, kind of things that we would show in presentations, those are really core to show. And um, the other thing that people, I think a lot of designers um, don't like to talk about, um, kind of this like white elephant in the room, but um, aesthetics are incredibly important. <laughs> I don't think that's talked about enough in school. And uh, it's the difference between a designer and an engineer. I think it's important to like recognize and reflect like what kind of products consumers are buying, what has been seen as success models in, in the industry, like no famous designers that inspire you, like look at those designs, like tear them apart in details, like understanding proportions and forms and shapes, not to copy and paste what they've done, but just to like, understand what makes good aesthetics what attracts you to, and other people to products and like try to mimic that in your portfolio like good aesthetics uh if there's not something eye-catching when i look through a portfolio it just goes right into the trash bin <laughs> these are all just gold nuggets that you're dropping on everyone here <laughs> Um, we do have aesthetics are so <laughs> crucial to being a good designer and simplicity too much student work is just like overly complicated absolutely um, this here is a very good question and it's asked by Tiffany who were your mentors and what were some of the things you learned from them that stick with you throughout till today mm -hmm. so my very first job I had an awesome mentor, His, her name was Shujan, um, and she was the senior designer I was working under. Um, she had a lot of great experience. She had like worked at Astro and LG and a few different places before we were working together. And she really like took me under her wing and she was an amazing sketcher. She like taught me like techniques and showed me how to sketch. My first time learning how to like visualize design put design presentations together so I just like seeing her thinking but she also helped me with my portfolio so I would work on my portfolio and take it into her and, and get uh, feedback on my portfolio um, as I was I was an intern 
and transitioned into a junior designer under her. But um, she also helped me like as I was applying for jobs when I was graduating because I wasn't sure if I was going to get hired full time. But she yeah, helped me make connections with people in the industry, uh, places where I could send my my portfolio. Um, and she really gave me the, the, the training that I needed in the early days of my career. <laughs> um, so under, understanding what people, what a junior designer needed to get a job and helping to kind of cater my portfolio and craft it to that. Um, so that really helped me in my early days. And I would say I was also lucky to have a senior designer who was a woman I had a strong voice and vision and just like I think watching her and kind of reflecting on her behaviors really guided me a lot um after that um very future step in life but when I was starting my studio uh, I looked at my ex-boss um all of my ex-bosses from I was at one and co and HTC when, when they went through the acquisition but my three bosses from that studio um were all really, really great mentors of mine along the path to starting my own studio. I would say I was lucky that we transitioned from a consultancy to being acquired. So it was no longer like a competition. So they were all big supporters of me starting the studio and gave me kind of tons of advice of what I needed to do throughout various steps from like the for before opening, like giving me encouragement to do it. And then, um, you know, connecting us with clients, um, giving us, a, giving myself and the team advice on how to grow and what we needed to do. So uh, I don't think Level would be at the place it was today if it wasn't for, uh, it was Jonas, Scott, and Claude, the three founders, uh, the three partners at One & Co who really were fundamental uh, to Level being where they are today. Yeah. Um... I think uh, a mentorship is extremely important and also um, it could be a little intimidating, especially now, like you mentioned, there really is, isn't any physical events happening. So it's a little tougher to, you know, connect with people. Um, but it is very, it's something that uh, a lot of our attendees are very interested in, in how to go about doing that right now. Um, you know, here's a question uh, that's being asked by Hannah. How do you navigate not asking too much of someone when trying to make that initial connection? Um, I would just make the time slot very, like, short. Just tell them you want, you know, 15 minutes or half an hour. Um, and you'd be surprised. I think people that really care will make the time um, just to help out. I do it. I hope I don't get overly bombarded. I do it from time to time when I, when I can. If somebody will tell me, oh, I just moved to San Francisco. I'm looking to connect with people or I'm looking for, um, yeah, like advice because I'm a student and trying to navigate what I want to do with my career. Um, and I will, when I can, make like time for the 15-minute phone calls. Used to be like half an hour coffee breaks. Um, just talking and, and giving advice. So I would say don't be afraid. Don't automatically assume that that person is too important. Um, the other thing that might happen is if you do reach out to someone who's a boss and has a lot on their plate, they might just off, you know, offer for you to talk to somebody else on their team who's maybe a you know, mid-level designer, or senior designer that has a little bit more time for, for these things. Um, but we often have people reach out to the studio and try and help as much as we can. And I'm sure that there are many, many places that have the same. So don't be afraid, uh, but just in your offers, just tell them you want it to be kind of short and sweet, you know, 15, 30 minutes max. <laughs> and, and straightforward because you don't want your mentor to be, you know, beating around the bush and they want, you want them to be very honest with you. Mm -hmm. And when you do have that, opportunity for a call and just be very hyper organized write out your questions in advance maybe even give them to your mentor in advance um, so that you you can just make that as streamlined as possible absolutely well uh we're gonna wrap up this lens session with one more question and this is a very good question um and this was asked by nicole 
in your Forbes article, you mentioned frequently being in a room full of men. Can you speak about the learning curve you had to learn how to communicate effectively in that situation? Uh, I've always just spoke my mind. <laughs> I would say, I think that was the learning that I had. It was just that I think too many women in those environments can get really intimidated and they tend to be really shy and keep their, their mouth shut. I would say, if anything, I have gotten to where I am today because I'm not afraid to speak up and I'm not afraid to tell people my, you know, whatever's on my mind. And I, I think that's what's gonna make the future generations of designers and uh, you know, design leaders uh, successful is that um, you know, there's just, there's like no BS, there's no um, like holding back and waiting. Like, you know, it's, it's your, like you're hired to have an opinion uh, and it's important to express that. And don't do it in uh, a way that's like nasty, but you sh you need to be confident in you in yourself. Like the reason that you have a job, the reason that you got there to begin with is because they value uh, your mind, and so you need to use it and bring that forward and and not be afraid. And you know, don't be afraid of the, the men in the room. Don't let them put you down. Don't let them hold you back and just don't be afraid to speak your mind. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much, Nicole, for being a part of our lens session and our initiative <laughs> with Advanced Design. And for those uh, who attended, thank you so much for tuning in on this wonderful evening. Um, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to get everyone's questions. Um, this is a very hot topic that we're gonna continue talking about. And that's essentially what this initiative is about, is to bring up these issues on design education. Um, uh, for those who wanna continue talking about this, after this uh, Zoom um, call, we're moving to another Zoom call called After Lens, where we talk more um, about these issues. Uh, so uh, from everyone here in Chicago, your favorite city in the world. Uh, thank you, Nicole, for joining us and uh, everyone have a good evening. Thanks, Hector, for everything that you're doing for the, the new generations. It's really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> thank you very much. Take care. Have a good one. Bye.